last time on our fascinating planet. A planet was born. It exploded all over itself and changed its own face. It survived its puberty, killed its dinosaurs, and then developed its own death-defying cycles to keep its starry insides in check. But it would leave its human outsides unchecked. This is our fascinating planet. The story of our Earth is a story of the life it has birthed and nurtured. And perhaps nothing has been birthed and nurtured more on Earth than... Animals, one of nature's most valuable resources. We chase them, we wear them, we play with them, we taunt them, we laugh at them, we roast them, we toast them, we even host them in our homes as pets. But lying just beneath the surface of these often ridiculous co-inhabitants of our shared home we call Earth is a much greater story, one filled with melodramatic danger and cosmic safety, all punctuated by glorious displays of our Earth's lifedom. The Earth has long used animals to sustain itself. They dig holes in its soil to ventilate it. They swim in its waters to hydrate it. They stampede on its ground to massage it and flap their wings in its air, moving its clouds to shade it. Animals eat plants to keep them from strangling the land and they convert chewed plant carcasses into feces, which helps thicken the earth's protective crust. And they urinate on its surface to quench its thirst and prevent it from exploding. And when they die, the animals melt into the earth, becoming food for plants. Animals eat plants, which then die and become food for new plants, which then also die and become dirt, which becomes food for the Earth. Put simply, the Earth would not be what it is today without its animals. But the best of these animals is man, who just so happens to also be the worst of these animals. No conversation about life on Earth is complete without addressing man's almost flippant disregard for his animal neighbors with whom he shares this planet. Statistically, man is the most dangerous animal on the planet. When you consider mankind's history and its clever use of things like jackhammers and atomic bombs, it's easy to see why. And man also ranks highest in conflicts. And at the same time, man ranks lowest in respect for the Earth. But how did we end up like this? It's almost as if man was destined to clash with Earth from the very beginning, a process that started with early humans who lived in trees and soon clashed with each other right out of those trees. So early man's first journey, a veritable leap from the tree to the ground, was also the first significant step toward what we call civilization. Once our species managed to come together on the ground, we suddenly discovered that a lot of us didn't like a lot of them. And so, there was conflict. Tribes began to separate, to sort themselves into warring factions based on their differences. Some separations were obvious, determined by things like hair type or body smell or geography. Specifically, those who were good at geography went one way and those who were not got lost. And as they wandered, trying to find their way back, they accidentally populated the Earth. But one thing would prove to separate human beings from each other more than anything else 
something called religion. Man has long practiced religion because... It's the opposite. It's easy. You know, draw a circle, you wear a hat, talk about the sun. You know, maybe you get to burn a woman while she's still alive. <laughs> People love that, to set um, women on fire. Um, sometimes you got to kill a bird, so animal cruelty was always really appealing. With the advent of religion, man took his first real step toward changing the planet. Early man's gods not only helped him describe small events like a poor harvest or diarrhea, but also larger phenomena like tornadoes, floods, plague, even earthquakes. All of this could be ascribed to an invisible source in the sky. So man, almost from his beginning, looked not to Earth for answers, but away from it, and then beyond it, putting himself and his needs above his planet. And his gods would be instrumental in cultivating his disregard for the Earth itself. There was the Greek god of trash, the Inca god of killing things for fun, and the Chinese god of burning whatever you could whenever you felt like it. And of course, the Nordic god of earth rape. For these gods were the perfect scapegoats. Perhaps no better example can be found than the Roman god, Scape, a goat. In every ancient language we see recurring phrases like, the gods made me do it, you know, that f***ing goat, you know, that kind of thing. So the goat was very prevalent uh, in households. People talked about that a lot. By removing any responsibility from himself, man was free to wreak havoc on the planet, and he would attack the Earth in many ways. We started by assaulting the Earth's plants. We began to grow them only to kill them and eat them, and sometimes to smoke them. Animals soon became a favorite target for man. We hunted, killed, wore, and even teased animals, even turning some of them into our play slaves or pets. A barbaric custom that is still practiced in many places today. This has had dire consequences. But perhaps man's greatest assault has been on the earth itself. Building homes and towns, digging into the earth to extract minerals, to make vitamins and jewelry, and decorating the land in embarrassing ways. Soon cities began to rise. The goal was clear, remove all traces of nature as quickly as possible. And in many places, we've succeeded in doing just that. We went from living in small straw huts to living in tall straw skyscrapers almost overnight, which today, of course, are no longer made of straw, but of balsa wood and concrete and plexiglass. These concrete jungles and prairies have replaced the regular jungles and prairies that once ruled the planet, leaving man today with little choice but to live and die in his own industrial wasteland. Today, five in every seven people lives in a city, and of those, two in every three are 10 times more likely to spend the remaining three-fifths of their life in the heart of that city, and of those, 90% will die in a city, and of those, 80% will die a violent death in that city, and of those, 10% will live in either an urban or rural area. And so today we find a planet that is in many places almost unrecognizable. Animals often look confused or embarrassed as they enter our habitats. And even worse, many of them have suffered psychologically from our overwhelming impact. Animals replicate human life. You'll see human cultures behaving a certain way. Animals go, oh, humans are better than me. I want to behave like that. And you'll see that. I'll, I study quail patterns, how quails interact over time. And you'll, quails act like people. And it's disgusting. You know, it's wrong. But it's fascinating. And also, we keep animals as pets because they're not as smart. They're not as intelligent. We eat them for food because they're objects, essentially. Objects with a heart. So it causes a lot of questions to come up. 
and we mock the earth by making things like plastic Christmas trees and wooden ducks. Man has displayed an almost tragic arrogance towards his planet. While we jump for Jupiter and salivate over Saturn, we are brazen enough to use the very material from the Earth to make small, ridiculous dolls of it, called globes. On top of that, to get these very materials, we have penetrated the Earth and robbed it of its fossil fuels. Fossil fuels which we burn like witches or dogs. This has had dire consequences, namely, globular warming. Our planet is in trouble. There's no question about that now. And man, more than any species, is responsible for it. Fire, once thought to be man's best friend, now turns out to be one of nature's worst enemies. It's likely we're gonna destroy ourselves. Right. But that's something that's also seemed likely for a really long time, and we've made it this far. In fact, the future is in our hands, both our own future and our planet's. The question is, what do we do with it? So what does the future hold for our fascinating planet? The current interglacial period ends, sending the Earth into another ice age. Extinction of animals continues to occur until they are all gone and we all become vegan, removing all joy from the planet. Father Earth comes back, and we must decide which Earth we want to live on. Everything works out, and we learn to live harmoniously with our planet. Well, that's up to you. The Earth is not just our home. It is also our friend and our enemy, much like a mother or a foster ant. We may leave this planet someday, or it may explode, and we will find ourselves living on small, oddly shaped earthlets hurtling through space, which will never be as good as the planet was when it was all together in one big ball the way it is today. We don't know what will happen. Only the future can tell us that. But in the meantime, instead of telling this planet what to do, as we have for centuries, maybe we should start listening to her. And when we do, let's not be so arrogant that we end up laughing at what she has to say. <laughs>